worshiping you and um, lifting you up, Lord. And we just um, pray for safety and protection and good health over everyone. And um, just that we'd be able to come into your presence and worship you this morning. Jesus, the 
the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you And holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To those around me Worthy of every song we could ever sing
I'll turn it over to Pastor now. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. leading under worship today. Um, have a shout out to uh, Tony and Marge who celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary yesterday. And a uh, special, couple special people have birthdays uh, today. Um, Della Stone and uh, my granddaughter, Avea. So happy birthday to them. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, my wife broke her arm yesterday. Pray for her. She's in, she's uh, in a lot of pain. And I want to thank everyone for helping with the Parsonage roof and for bringing food in. Uh, actually, it was a very enjoyable time. And uh, today I'd like to preach to you on a very familiar story. Daniel, Shadrach, uh, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the book of Daniel. And I would encourage you not to turn me off today because I, I know that when we do familiar stories, we think, oh, I've heard all this before. I, I know this story. I'm This is a story we've heard since we were children in Sunday school, vacation Bible school. 
or whatever, but I promise you today, I can almost guarantee that you'll learn something new from this, uh, this message this morning. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Daniel in chapter 3. I'm not going to read the passage at the very beginning because it's a lengthy passage, but what I will do is uh, read it as we go through the story. And, uh, just to let you know, this is not the kind of in-depth study I usually do on a Sunday morning. It's more like a Wednesday night. We're going to look at some background and, and some things that perhaps you didn't know or consider. We're going to dig below uh, the surface of this story this morning. I'm going to call it uh, the three men who wouldn't bend, bow, or burn. We could always also call it furnace faith. We, um, when I was growing up, we, we couldn't remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So we had these, these funny little names uh, for them, like your shack, my shack, and a bungalow, or shake a bed, make a bed, and to bed we go. We had trouble remembering their names, but you might forget their names, but you won't forget their story. One of these interesting things that Daniel is not included in this chapter. He's in every other chapter in Daniel, and we'll talk about why they, that might be a little bit later. In Hebrews chapter 11, it, it categories great acts of faith. In verse 33 says, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in uh, fight. And you, there we see they quench the violence of fire. That's talking about these three right here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their story is among the great acts of faith. They are not forgotten. They are included in these great acts. And I'll admit that I like fiction books, and the first rule for good fiction is something has to go wrong. I mean, that's what makes the story interesting. Something has to go wrong. You don't really have a story until something goes wrong. You know, that's true of life as well. And that's the way it works with trusting the Lord. We don't understand faith until something goes wrong in our life. Faith is a matter of relying on the Lord when our story, when our life encounters a problem. And in fact, in some ways, our Christian life works best when things go awry. And of course, sometimes it seems like everything is going awry all at once. This is what happened here to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But of course, this is not a story of fiction. This is something that really happened. And doubters say, well, this couldn't have happened because nobody could survive being put in a furnace like that. I mean, look what happened to the people who threw them in. It, it's impossible. That's the point. That is exactly the point. That's why it's included in the scripture. With men, things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And uh, the key word in this chapter is the word worship. Eleven times we find the word worship. And the choice is really, will they worship God or will they worship this golden image? Will they bow down to it and worship it? It's a chapter about worship. It's also a chapter about faith because obviously the one you have faith in is also the one that you will give your worship to. If you wanted to divide this chapter, we could just do it in two parts. Verses 1 through 7 is the golden image, and verses 8 through 30 would be the fiery furnace. I want to divide it a little bit differently today. I'll give you the outline right up there at the beginning. We're going to talk about the young men who are tested, the young men who are accused, the young men arraigned, the young men sentenced, the young men delivered, and then the young men rewarded. So let's begin to uh, look at that point by point. First of all, the young men uh, tested. In verses 1 through 7, it says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. 
And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried out, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, butt, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And whoso falleth not down and worship shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time when all the people heard the sound of all those instruments and all that music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Let's look, first of all, at its substance, the substance of this image. It's made of, it's made of gold. Maybe not complete gold, maybe overlaid with gold, but nevertheless, it has the appearance of gold. This may have been a statue of Nebuchadnezzar himself. Uh, where did he get the idea of making this gold statue out of gold? Well, in chapter 2, he has a dream or a nightmare, and the image that he saw was a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, the belly and the thighs were made of brass or bronze, and the legs were iron, and the feet were iron mixed with clay. And when Daniel gave the interpretation, he told Nebuchadnezzar that he was the head of gold. And after him was going to uh, come different empires. There would be silver and, and bronze and so forth. And they would represent these various kingdoms. Now when Nebuchadnezzar makes this image, he doesn't make it gold, silver, bronze, and so forth. He makes the whole thing gold. What is he saying? He's saying, I know, Daniel, you said there's going to be another kingdom that comes after me. But you know what? I'm going to just make this whole thing of gold. In other words, my kingdom is going to last forever. Nobody's going to take my kingdom away from me. My kingdom will not be replaced. It shows the pride that he had. That's the substance. And then let's look at the size of this thing. It's interesting. The height was 60 cubits and its width six cubits. 60 cubits is about 90 feet, and the width was about nine feet. You think about that, that would be pretty narrow. It's a nine-story building, only nine feet wide. Perhaps the image was placed on a pedestal, and that pedestal was included in the height. The point is that this was something that was very impressive. If we look at the site that it was placed in, it's in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. This would have been seen for miles. Archaeologists have discovered a large brick pedestal 45 feet square and 25 feet high on a plain six miles southeast of Babylon. An, an impressive scene, a 90-foot uh, a, a statue of gold standing on a flat plain shimmering in the sunlight. It would have been an overwhelming view. And then you have the subjects. Every level of government is sent out here to bow to this image. What was the purpose of this ceremony? And if we look at history at that time, it might shed some light on this. The Babylonian Chronicle, uh, which was an ancient document of that time, reveals that Nebuchadnezzar suffered a takeover attempt of his government in December 595 through January 494 B.C. I mean, this is something that would really shake you up as a leader, especially if you were a, a younger leader at that time. So I think what he is requiring here is a loyalty oath. He's angry at those that were rising up against him, and so he's making all the leaders of his kingdom come and bow down to an image of himself and in the process take an oath of loyalty. So this was a, a litmus test of loyalty. If anybody didn't bow down to this image, they would be immediately killed. Now here's something that, that is fascinating. We don't know this for sure, but King Zedekiah from Judah might have been present. When Nebuchadnezzar came to power and, and came in and, and uh, took away captives from Judah in 605, he put a man by the name of Jehoiakim on the throne. But in 597, he 
revolted. And he rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar came and put an end to that. And he put Zedekiah on the throne. He was, he was a vassal. He really he just paid tribute to Nebuchadnezzar. And it was a puppet who ruled for Nebuchadnezzar. But in 586, Nebuchadnezzar comes back and he puts out Zedekiah's eyes. And he takes him back to Babylon. I would imagine that all of those vassals came to bow down and show their loyalty to Nebuchadnezzar as well. And if he did, then Zedekiah was one of them. What does that tell us that he did, though? When the music sounded, he hit the deck, just like the rest of them, giving worship to this image. Here is the king of Judah who should have been standing for God and trusting in God, bowing before this idol, worshiping Nebuchadnezzar. So it makes what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did all the more impressive. As they stand there, just the three of them, they stand alone for God. They had the courage to stand and not bow down. Uh, let's look at the sound. There's music and a band to promote the awesomeness and the solemnness of this occasion. They played something probably like Hail to the Chief. Music and an orchestra like this adds to the occasion. You know, music is also always associated with worship. And the music is mentioned several times because this is a key part of what is going on. So again, this is an impressive, impressive uh, scene. You have the glistening image. You have the who's who of the Babylonian Empire. People dressed in their, their royal official uniforms. And then you have the Babylonian Philharmonic Orchestra there. I mean, think about that. These officials wearing their colorful uniforms, sitting on a, a raised stage, and thousands of people gathered out there on that flat plain. And then we come to this fiery furnace. What is that? If you read in Jeremiah 29, 22, and Jeremiah was a contemporary of Daniel. And Jeremiah 22 says, May the Lord make you like Zedekiah and like Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. Now, I want you to know that this is not the same Ahab that was around during the times of Elijah. Uh, this is not Zedekiah that I talked about just earlier, the, the king of Judah. These are other men. This was a, this was a, these were popular names, common names in that day. But these two men were Jewish prophets who predicted the, the imminent downfall of Babylon. And Jeremiah wrote these words probably just a few weeks before the event of Daniel chapter 3. So Nebuchadnezzar had already been burning people in this furnace. It was a favorite way of his to get rid of his enemies. And this was probably a, a brick kiln. And the city of Babylon was made literally with millions of bricks. And every brick was stamped with words praising Nebuchadnezzar. So it's, it's sun-dried bricks fired in these brick kilns. And these, these would heat up to about, about 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And people were dropped in uh, from the top. There was an opening where people then could look in and see these bricks being fired there. And you notice the call in verse 7, that at the time when the people heard the, all of these instruments and all of this music, the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Can you imagine what a scene this must have been? They are all standing there, and at the moment when the signal is given, the music begins to play. Everybody just hits the deck. They go down like dominoes, and they worshipped. This must have fed the pride and the ego of the king. And then we see the, as the next thing, the young men accused. Let's continue on in verse 8. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of these instruments again and this music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. 
There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So Nebuchadnezzar probably didn't even know when the great crowd of people that they hadn't bowed, but the Chaldeans there, they're tattled.